They say that hypothermia is one of the most gruesome ways to die. Only right at the end do you feel a sudden sense of incredible warmth sweeping over your body, and the cold has all but disappeared. This brief moment of solace is actually the sign that you are about to die. It's my hope, my dear friends, that you never experience such a feeling. But this makes for great inspiration for tonight's story. So, my dear friends, sit down and relax with your favorite drink, because now it's time to listen. Have you ever had the displeasure of experiencing minus 40 degrees weather? That's Celsius and Fahrenheit, because minus 40 is the point where the two converge. It's a temperature so cold that it's impossible for snow to fall. If you've never felt it, allow me to explain what it's like. Your eyelashes turn white with frost. Now start collecting humidity from your breath forming icicles that make each lash stick together. Every time you blink, it's a struggle to reopen your eyes. Even if you try not to blink, the air is so dry that you have to, otherwise your eyeballs start to hurt. With each inhale, your nose hairs freeze and shoot needles of pain up your nasal canal. Your coat, no matter how thick or expensive, stiffens like a pair of jeans forgotten to dry at the bottom of the washer. You'll hear your clothes crackle like a down comforter with every move you make. Any exposed skin starts to burn. Your extremities freeze, and no matter how much you rub your hands, your fingers go numb. You feel compelled to move around to try and warm up, but moving lets more cold air through the openings in your clothes. If you're lucky, moving will warm you up a bit, but if you're not, you will start feeling very hot. Too hot. A burning sensation will run up your spine, and you will start to sweat. This means you've reached your danger zone. The point where cold no longer feels cold, and where you start shedding your clothes to avoid overheating. And that's how you wind up dead. No matter how thin your gloves, how little your coat seems to help, in minus 40 degree weather, they're essential. They're a barrier between you and the biting chill. They're the only things that can help keep you alive. So, why am I saying this? Well, I want to tell you about something that's been going on for decades in Saskatoon. Gruesome cases of human rights violations come to be known as the Saskatoon Freezing Deaths. Before I start my story, I wanted you to understand how truly horrible it must be for its victims. You see, offices in Saskatoon have a very original way of dealing with the drunken Native Americans. In the middle of winter, they've been known to arrest drunkards, drive them outside of town, strip them down to their underwear, and tell them to walk it off. The police call this the Midnight Blue Tour. Now, as you might expect, the victims die of hypothermia long before they can make it back home. It's not known how many have died this way. A quick search of missing sisters, an unrelated issue where Aboriginal women have gone missing, <laughs> assumed dead, will show you just how little the police and authorities care about the plight of Native Americans. Participants of the Midnight Blue Tour have allegedly been found frozen on the side of the road, 
and their deaths swept under the rug. However, from time to time, victims' bodies won't be found at all. Their footprints turn to drag marks leading to the forest, but no blood or animal tracks are ever left to explain what was doing the dragging. The officers never investigate these cases further. You might be wondering where I fit into all of this. Well, my friend's uncle went missing this winter. A few people came forward, saying they'd seen a cop throwing him into his squad car and driving off. But there are no records of him getting booked. Here in Saskatoon, we'd all heard the rumours of the Midnight Blue Tour. But it was one of those things we never talked about. No one wanted to blab about the abuse of power, because we didn't want to be the next victims of it, you know? In any case, let me take you back to when Paul first knocked on my door with the news. That morning, I was getting ready to go to work when my friend Paul knocked on my door. As soon as I opened it, a wave of cold air came rushing over my bare feet. I was quick to let Paul in and close the door. My friend shuffled from foot to foot, rubbing his arms furiously to try and warm himself up. I shuddered. <sighs> Colder than my ex-wife's heart out there. I mumbled. What's up, man? Paul pointed to the kitchen. C coffee I nodded. Oh, yeah. Hold on. I'll go get a pot started. Paul kicked off his boots and shuffled to the living room. As I started the coffee machine, I could still feel the chill lingering in the air. The kitchen window was caked with so much frost that I couldn't even see outside. It was going to be one of those days. I hoped I'd managed to get my truck started. A few minutes later I found Paul covered all the way up to his nose in Nana's knitted blanket, eagerly waiting for me to deliver the coffee. As much as he seemed to thirst for it, he barely let his hand escape the cover of the blanket to take the cup when I offered it. He pulled it under the blanket, up to his mouth, and drank a large sip. Jesus, Paul. You can't be that cold. Paul shivered. <sighs> Car broke down a mile and a half back. <sighs> Had to walk. He said, still stuttering from the cold. I looked out of the window to my truck sitting alone in the parking lot. What the hell were you doing driving in this part of town at five in the morning anyway? He sipped his coffee, looking for my uncle. I got a call last night. He got picked up by the cops. I felt an instant sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. The way he said it made it sound so much worse than what it should have been. So you were going to bail him out? Paul looked me straight in the eyes. I knew what he was going to say. I knew what had happened to his uncle. He never made it to jail. Even though we were alone, even though we were in my house, I still found myself looking over my shoulder and lowering my voice to a whisper. These kinds of things were never discussed. Ever. You think he took the Midnight Blue tour? Paul nodded. Yeah. He finished his coffee and held the mug out to me. I filled it, handed it back, and left the pot on the living room table. I had a feeling he'd eventually want a third serving. He continued. Got a call an hour after they took him in thought maybe I could save him, but he paused, eyebrows coming together. Too many roads in and out of town. I scratched my stubbly chin. Ah, shit. I whispered. My eyes wandered to the clock. Paul's gaze followed. We both knew it would be too late now. Will you help me find his body? Asked Paul. I don't want to drag you into this, but like I said, my car. He trailed off. Yeah, 
Of course, I answered. You warm up and I'll start the truck and call off work, all right? He nodded, but said nothing more. Soon after, we were on the road with a thermos full of coffee and another full of warm soup. I was bundled up tighter than a toddler going on his first snow luge ride, and Paul had borrowed an extra scarf and hat. It was even worse outside than I thought. Even with the heat at maximum, I could still feel cold emanating from the windshield. I had to point the heating ducts right at the steering wheel to keep my fingers from freezing. Meanwhile, Paul held the thermos and stared off into the distance, a defeated look in his eyes. I couldn't blame him. We were on a mission to find the frozen remains of the man who'd practically raised him. All because a cop had a bit of a power trip and a burning hatred of Native Americans. You know which bar he was at? I asked. Yard and Flagon. He replied. Why? He'll probably be on that side of town then. I answered. He shook his head. I already checked all the roads around there. I think he was dropped off farther away. I stopped the car and reached into my glove compartment for a map. I had Paul mark off all the roads he checked already. And then we headed for the next one. We went up and down, road after road, not finding a trace of his uncle. That is, until a few hours later, when we finally spotted a subtle breach in the wall of snow on a road on the opposite side of town. I slowed the truck to a stop, unbuckled, and jumped out to examine it. Paul followed behind. The cold January air sent an instant shiver down my spine. I suddenly understood why Paul had practically chugged the coffee earlier. Cold wasn't just a little nippy, it was downright assaulting. Even when you've grown up with the cold, there's really no way to prepare for minus 40 degrees. I hugged myself as I inspected the three foot tall snowbank. There was an imprint the size of a human body. If that wasn't proof enough of his uncle's presence, then the bare footprints leading up to the indent sealed his fate. We'd found the right spot. Where'd he go? Asked Paul, a hint of panic in his voice. Maybe someone picked him up already? Paul climbed the mound of snow and looked out towards the forest. No, look. I followed him up the snowbank. It emitted crunching sounds beneath my feet, but didn't break. The cold had turned the usually soft and sticky snow into the consistency of styrofoam. I followed Paul's gaze and saw a path of fissured snow leading to the forest. This, I realized meant Paul's uncle had been dragged into the woods. A prospect that pleased neither of us. Bear? I asked. Paul shook his head. I could tell he'd already gone through all the scenarios in his head. Bear, wolf, serial killer on a snowmobile. He squinted. There's only one set of tracks. Maybe he dragged himself to shelter. Maybe he saw a cabin. He looked at me with big, brown, hopeful eyes. I didn't want to tell him it was impossible. I didn't want to point out that, even if he was right, and his uncle had gone into the woods, he'd surely died of exposure long before finding a cabin. That's not what friends do. Friends help friends. Even when it's minus 40 degrees out, and all you want to do is curl up in front of a fireplace and hibernate until winter's over. Paul still had hope. So, we'd press on. <laughs> Let's check it out then, I said. The snow on the other side of the embankment was about two feet high, but thankfully it had been so condensed and hardened by the frigid air that I could easily walk over it without breaking through. 
Paul and I kept a few meters distance from one another to even out the distribution of weight over the terrain. We hurriedly approached the edge of the woods, where his uncle's tracks came to an abrupt stop, exactly on the limit between the small field of snow and the first row of trees. By all logic, if the track stopped, then we should have found his uncle. But his uncle was nowhere to be seen. What the hell? He should be right here. Where'd he go? Snow is probably too hard for the tracks. <laughs> Come on, he can't be far, said Paul, stepping into the woods. While it was true that the snow cracked less inside the wood than out, I still saw it fissuring every few steps. There was no way Paul's uncle, a man twice my weight and two feet taller than me, could have managed to walk over it without breaking it. Paul, however, didn't seem to notice. He continued on, distancing himself from me to cover more ground. He called out his uncle's name over and over, even as his voice became raspier and weaker. By now, I was already regretting having left the thermos in the truck. Even with my winter gear, I could feel cold snaps nipping at the skin around my eyes and easily infiltrating my clothes. My lashes, now bright white, were winning a battle to permanently glue my eyes shut. I tried hard to breathe through my nose to avoid dampening my scarf, but found myself panting to try and keep up with Paul, and, inevitably, a blanket of moist frost settled over the portion of fabric covering my mouth. It melted whenever I exhaled, but froze again when I inhaled. The sometimes soggy, sometimes frosty material rubbed against my lips, irritating my skin. Oh shit! What the fuck? screamed Paul. What the fuck? I heard an ear-piercing shriek that cut through the cold, dry air like a blade. His scream was dizzying, nauseating even. It caught me so off guard that I momentarily froze. Still, I was able to look up just quickly enough to catch a silhouette running away. Before I heard the sound of snow breaking under the pressure of Paul's fall, a short distance from the figure, I ran over to him and helped him back up. Did you see that? He asked, panicked. Yeah, there's someone here with us. I replied. Paul shook his head. That wasn't a person. Those words would have sent a chill down my spine, if I wasn't already so cold. What? What are you talking about? Man, it. It. He swatted snow off his pants. <laughs> it wasn't human, man. I turned towards where I'd seen the silhouette. Paul turned whiter than rice in a snowstorm. I know what I saw. We need to go back. Right. Fucking now. I'm telling you, man. We need to get back to the truck. But... I started. Now! He screamed. He grabbed my arm and yanked me so hard I thought I was about to lose a limb. Paul had this look of deep, primal fear in his eyes. I followed him out of the woods, partially because I couldn't break out of his vice-like grip, and partially because he genuinely seemed terrified. And that, in turn, freaked me out. He didn't speak, not until we were safely in the truck, with the doors locked and the engine on. What happened? I asked. <sighs> Drive! I started down the road, not too fast thinking he'd come to his senses and ask me to turn back for his uncle. The fuck is wrong with you? Paul shivered. Paul shivered, and I had a feeling it wasn't from the cold. It looked like my uncle. He murmured. It? The thing we saw. He snapped back. Look, I don't know what you saw, but 
I just saw some guy. Honestly. I replied. It wasn't a man. He whispered. Paul! What the fuck are you going on about? He didn't answer. No matter how much I pushed him, he wouldn't tell me what he saw. So, I drove us back to my place and escorted him inside. It was only when he removed his hat and scarf that I noticed a stream of blood that poured out of his ears. Jesus Christ, Paul! What the hell happened to you? Paul sat on the couch and pulled Nana's blanket up to his chin. He rocked back and forth, though I'm not sure if it was from the trauma or the cold. It looked like my uncle. You said that already. I groaned as I turned up the heat. Paul's teeth clattered together. Again, it was a toss of the coin to know whether it was from the cold or from fear. It came up to me, man. This thing. It was floating, hovering over the ground. Didn't you see it? I shook my head. I just saw a silhouette. That's all. It wasn't a person. I saw it up close, he said, shuddering. It had this weird cloak on, man. It kind of... I could see it moving. Not the fabric, just the, the pattern of it. Like a night sky with clouds and stuff. It, it wasn't normal. and you know, I could see its face. It looked just like my uncle. But it, it wasn't him. He... Paul looked over his shoulder. And then back at me. <laughs> he had no, no eyes. Just, just empty sockets. Like some kind of monster. And his skin. Oh, shit. It was all black. Like rotten skin. Black. Like some fucking intense frostbite shit. And his mouth. Mother. Oh, fuck. His lips were purple and his teeth. They were sharp. All of them. When he screamed at me, I saw all the way down his throat. They were pointy and sharp, all the way to the back. I stood there in stunned silence, trying to make sense of what he was saying. Wait, he? I started. It, he corrected. It? Screamed? I thought that was you. He shook his head. I remembered the disorientation I felt when I heard the shriek. There was something off about it, but it hadn't even occurred to me that the sound hadn't come from Paul. The scream felt, felt like I was being stabbed right in the ears with ice. It was like brain freeze, but full body brain freeze. I was paralyzed, man. Fucking paralyzed. But then he looked me in the eyes and just kind of shot away and I fell I took a seat unscrewing the lid of the thermos I wasn't sure which one it was until I took a gulp but I didn't care coffee or soup the warmth was what I wanted but it seemed like no matter how much I drank I couldn't cast away the chill it felt like the cold was coming from inside of me Fear was what I was feeling, not the biting minus 40 degree weather, because, somehow, deep inside of me, I knew Paul was right. I hadn't seen the silhouette clearly, but when I thought about it, when I replayed the moment in my head, I didn't see any legs touch the ground. Paul's uncle's body was never found. I don't think either of us expected it to turn up. And, as expected, the disappearance was swept under the rug. So, why am I only talking about this now? Why am I, in the middle of this hot summer day, sharing a story about the dead of winter? 
It's because something happened this morning. Something that left me sweating. And not from the heat. This morning, exactly six months to the day that Paul's uncle went on a midnight blue tour, Officer Mackay was reported missing. Drag marks were found next to his bed. Broken fingernails were dug deep into his wooden floorboards, and ten bloody, scratchy streaks, one for each finger, were found leading all the way down the stairs and out the door. They continued down his gravel parking lot, forming rake-like grooves, led through the grass, and made it all the way up to the edge of the forest. That's where Officer Mackay's tracks end. There were no animal tracks left to explain what was doing the dragging. Mackay is one of five cops to have inexplicably gone missing in the past 40 years. A lot of people know about the horrible things that happen here in Saskatoon, but no one ever talks about them. Those police disappearances are just another thing we sweep under the rug, just like the Midnight Blue Tour. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>